For most of its history, southern Africa was more or less isolated. The currents in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans proved difficult to manage. There were few natural harbors, and even those had to contend with seasonal winds. As well, there are no navigable rivers. The land consists mostly of a plateau interspersed with river valleys and a coastal plain. This area is the only land with rainfall over 20 inches a year, including the Cape Peninsula. The first people to inhabit this land would have to be those who migrated from the north of the African continent. The Khoisan peoples would settle around the western coastline, while the Bantu peoples would do the same in the east. Khoisan is a general term applied to the Khoikhoi and San people, who came from the same language group. The Khoikhoi were the pastoralists and herders, while the San were the hunter-gatherers. Contrary to popular misconceptions of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, as rugged and dismal, they lived relatively well. Having thousands of years to master the art of the hunt, some tribes were able to get well above the daily caloric requirement, only needing to work about 15 hours a week. They were thus able to have copious amounts of time, dedicated to artistic pursuits. Opposed in lifestyle and philosophy, the pastoralists built societies around herding sheep and cattle. This required more time and energy and more labor, thus making their bands much bigger. There required more work, the food supply was more reliable, thus making them taller and stronger than their hunter-gatherer counterparts. The cattle were their property, a measure of wealth and status in their society. These people lived between the edge of the Kalahari Desert and the 20-inch rainfall line. They would interact with one another either by trading pastoralist milk for hunter-gatherer game or by sporadic clashes where hunter-gatherers would raid cattle that intruded in their territory. Within the 20-inch rainfall zone would be where the mixed farmers of the Bantu kingdoms would live. The Bantu peoples probably came from somewhere around modern-day Nigeria and were part of a completely different language group than the Khoisan peoples. From these Bantu peoples, we would get modern-day tribes such as the Zosa, Zulu, Sotho, Pedi, and Swana tribes. The Bantu peoples had economies based in agriculture, pastoralism, and metallurgy. Unlike the Khoisan peoples, the Bantu peoples were more sedentary, living in villages and small hamlets. Bantu societies were thus more cohesive and hierarchical. They had complex social relationships such as marriage, concepts of wealth in the form of cattle, and many rituals and traditions that concern the transition from boy to man and the reinforcement of their social hierarchy. By lending out cattle to poorer individuals and by marrying various brides, certain men were able to consolidate autonomous chiefdoms where they would govern with the consent of his community to settle disputes. Soon these Bantu people would become dominant interacting with the hunter-gatherers in either feuds for cattle raids or as trading partners. It is important to realize that these groups were not isolated from one another and mixed, often leaving genetic imprints. The mixed farming societies would often incorporate the hunter-gatherers into their society, especially pastoralists who shared their cattle herding practices. This complicated relationship between these various societies would soon be interrupted by the intrusion of some weird pale men trying to sail around the Cape of Africa for spices. The first Europeans to interact with South Africa were the Portuguese in 1487 who visited the Cape, and then in 1497 who rounded the Cape to visit India. The Portuguese would establish bases in what would be modern-day Angola and Mozambique, but for a long time, many would struggle to establish one at the Cape due to the unfavorable currents and seasonal winds. Over the next century of exploration, colonization, and seafaring imperialism, the English, French, and Scandinavian mariners would use the Cape Peninsula as a respite. But it would be the Dutch who would establish a foothold in this land. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company occupied Table Bay to facilitate trade with their colony in Indonesia. At first, there was no intention to settle this land beyond a few fortified bases, but soon these Dutchmen would settle and expand throughout the land. The first settlers were company men, who were discharged in allotted land near Table Bay in order to farm and sell produce to the company. These people were called burghers, and were descendants from the lower classes of Dutch and German society. They were also terrible farmers, and imported enslaved people from Mozambique, Madagascar, India, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia to labor for them. This would be the foundation of Cape Town, 
from which further encroachment on native land would be made. The people to face the brunt of the intrusion would be the Khoi Khoi people. At first they traded with the burghers and the company, but as they began to encroach on their land, conflict began to brew. In a brief war over cattle, the burghers triumphed and became confident in their abilities against the natives. They ramped up their abuses, imprisoning Khoi Khoi charged with theft on Robin Island and taking their sheep and cattle, thus leaving them subordinate to the burghers. Then, a smallpox epidemic decimated the population, nearly wiping them out and ensuring they couldn't resist against the burghers. Some burghers began to expand past the Cape encampment. They were called the Trek Boers. They would take control of the land that the Khoi Khoi could no longer hold on to, but their expansion was curtailed by the extremely arid north the hunter-gatherers of the northeast, and the Bantu kingdoms of the east. The Bantu people, with their more cohesive social structure, were harder to subjugate and weren't affected by Dutch diseases. For expansion to continue further, they would need to exist a power that exceeded the paltry efforts of the burghers and trek goers. The French Revolution saw the British clamber for the upper hand against the French, which resulted in them asserting themselves as the number one naval power in the world in the Battle of Gibraltar. As a part of this push for naval supremacy, the British occupied the Cape Colony in 1795, which then revolted and then got reconquered in 1806, firmly establishing British rule. The British adopted the Batavian Republic's previous roadblocks to expansion, and by roadblocks I mean the Zosa. The Zosa were cleared from their land all the way to the Fish River. Then, in 1820, the British sent settlers to take this land. The British referred to the Dutch as Boers, which meant farmer, and it was sort of a derogatory term. There were clear animosities between these two groups. However, being minorities in the land, they were willing to accept British domination in order to better fight the native blacks. British domination, however, entailed British law and foreign missionaries, who at this point in British history were anti-slavery, and abolished the practice throughout the empire. The Dutch settlers, who had relied on the enslaved and who had been upset at British domination in general, set about on a migration throughout South Africa to found two states, the Orange Free State and the South African Republic. They would face fierce resistance from the natives, but they were also able to exploit internal divisions and weaken their social structures by exploiting their labor and thus were able to gain the upper hand. However, this was a long and protracted process. The history of the various tribes of South Africa is extremely convoluted, and each kingdom deserves an in-depth examination of their history. However, for the purpose of understanding the methods that the British used to colonize this land, I will be examining the fate of the Zosa and Zulu kingdoms, but please make sure to do more research on the Sotho, Peti, and other tribes. The first method that was used was brute force and military power. The Zosa were the first of the Bantu kingdoms to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Afrikaners and repelled them three times. But then, the British joined the fighting and were able to defeat the Zosa in 1812, 1819, 1834, 1846, and 1850. They would defeat them using their advanced militaries and by destroying their homes, crops, and cattle, forcing their women and children to starve, each time taking more and more land and clearing out Zosa for white settlement. What is important to note about these wars with the British and Afrikaners is that the Zosa were not just fighting these two groups, but also other African tribes. For example, in many conflicts, Afrikaners could rely on the Khoi Khoi to bolster their forces. The British were also able to convince members of the Mfengu tribe, who were refugees from a conflict, to abandon their Zosa patrons. Knowing the fate of the Africans under British and white South African rule, we can look back confused as to why the Africans didn't all join forces against the whites. However, this fails to realize that these African groups didn't have a unifying concept such as whiteness that allowed different peoples such as Afrikaners and British to unite against the Africans. The second method was the use of tribal leaders as puppets. After the British's clearance of the Zosa to beyond the Fish River in 1812, they began negotiations with an Ngika chief. Even though he wasn't the one in charge, the Gekaleka chief, who was in charge, joined with defectors to attack the Ngika chief. Divisions such as these would only get worse over time. After a war in 1846 resulted in the annexation of the land between the Kay and Kaskama rivers, the governor of Cape Colony, Harry Smith, who was a giant racist, placed white magistrates over their chiefs. When an Ngika chief named Sandile was deposed and replaced with a white regent, 
is also once again rebelled and were defeated. The next governor then used the same tactic of placing white magistrates over Zosa chiefs and making them salaried workers. The third method that was used was economic exploitation. These wars between Zosa and the British resulted in many cattle being taken or killed, and much land being given to whites and loyal Africans. There was also the issue of the main representation of wealth within Zosa society, cattle. When a European lung disease spread throughout the cattle, the Zosa were left without their primary type of wealth. With their land expropriated and their cattle decimated, the Zosa were thus reliant on white landowners for employment and became laborers. The British used this as an opportunity to civilize the Zosa through the lessons of hard labor. The internal divisions between the African tribal kingdoms, however, were best exemplified by the Metakana, or Times of Troubles. The Zulu Kingdom under Shaka Zulu was a militarized state with a standing army of around 40,000 warriors who went around the land brutally conquering territory held by surrounding tribes. This caused many Africans, including the previously mentioned Mefengu, to become landless refugees reliant on the whites for employment. The whites were thus able to take advantage of this refugee crisis to take even more land. Shaka's kingdom was fearsome, but his absolute power was enviable and thus he was assassinated by his half-brother, Dingane. However, the trek boers, who had been expanding into this territory, were able to win a decisive victory in what they called the Battle of Blood River, where a small number of European guns were able to defeat thousands of Zulu warriors with spears and cowhide shields. The Zulu leadership split into a series of power struggles for the monarchy, and soon the British would move in, annexing the colony of Natal, where they resided. They appointed tribal leaders as chiefs in order to control the population and put them on reservations in order to open up the land to British settlement. The British then brought in Indians to become farmers, as they were more experienced in the growth of sugar, which Zulu didn't know how to grow. In the 1830s, the Afrikaners began expanding further northeast. The Mefikane had created tons of unpopulated land that they could take. The Dutch Afrikaners were opposed to the British attempts to end slavery and evangelical attempts to end the exploitation of African labor. This migration was called the Great Trek, and would lead to the establishment of three republics. They left in Trek parties, headed by men of repute who led their families, neighbors, and dependents. These Trek parties would attempt to form a series of governments, but internal divisions and quarrels concerning who of these men of repute would be in charge led to multiple republics to be formed. The Trek Boers used brutal commando raids on the native African tribes in order to ensure expansion and the establishment of their republics. The First Republic of Natal was founded in 1839 and was quickly annexed by the British in 1843. However, two other republics would be formed and last much longer, gaining international recognition. The Orange Free State in 1854 and the South African Republic in 1852. These republics were founded on the idea of extreme racial supremacy that manifested in policies such as the forbidding of Africans to travel without a pass, to have firearms, or to participate in government. The British allowed these republics to exist as a part of their informal empire, as they were subject to British sanctions since they were both landlocked. However, the British left the Trek Boers to their own devices, and in fact, despite serious abuses and exploitation, the Africans were able to live their lives with some level of autonomy. The land, after all, had no value to the British beyond control of the critical port in the Cape and some sugar plantations in Muntal, for which they imported Indian labor. For the British to expand their control, and for the whites in general to ramp up their exploitation, they would need more motivation. In 1870, gold, diamonds, and other expensive minerals were found in South Africa. This radically shifted the political and economic climate of the colony. The cities of Johannesburg and Kimberley cropped up to mine diamonds and gold respectively. Rail networks, ports, African and European laborers, and tons of white investors all came together in order to pull these precious minerals out of the ground. And the British became ever more interested in controlling the land, and whites became ever more interested in exploiting the labor of the native Africans. The creation of these mining cities had transferred the segregation and domination of the Africans from a rural to an urban setting. They created harsh working conditions and interrupted African family structures by having the men leave the women for long periods of time to work. Africans were paid a small portion of the wages whites were paid, these mining towns were segregated and Africans were required to own passes in order to live in them. Africans were subject to humiliating searches of their person without a warrant on the accusation of stealing diamonds. The British had briefly annexed the Transvaal South African Republic in 1877 until it became free and recognized internationally in 1884. 
The republics would thus be a part of the informal empire until the British conquered them in the Second Boer War of 1902. <laughs> These were the most intense wars since the Napoleonic Wars and resulted in the use of concentration camps on the Afrikaner population, as well as many Africans who had fought with them. The British had done this relatively aggressive colonial conquest in order to better control the diamond and gold mines and to ensure control of southern Africa in competition with Germany, who had conquered Namibia and who was a rising power. So around this time there was the Cape Colony, the Natal Colony, the Orange Free State, and the Transvaal South African Republic. All of these territories had their own constitutions and laws, and restricted African rights by various degrees. In the Cape Colony, Africans could vote and become elected to Parliament, provided he could read, earn over 50 pounds a year, or had land. This, of course, disproportionately affected Africans who thus had no representation in Parliament and had only 5% of the registered voting population. In the Natal, white men could vote, provided they passed some of the economic requirements, but Africans had virtually no people who could vote. In the Afrikaner republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, only white men could vote, completely disenfranchising Africans. When these states were all unified into the Union of South Africa, the Afrikaner population held a slight majority over the British, and the British in Natal were very afraid of the African population because of how severely they were outnumbered. When the British made all of these places into a dominion, many Africans thought that the British would improve their station, as they had fought alongside them in the Boer Wars but they were left high and dry as the British allowed the republics to choose their own franchise laws, as demonstrated, most of which excluded Africans. The Dominion also would not allow Africans to join its parliament. This fateful decision would serve as the skeleton on which the apartheid would continue to be built upon, culminating into more and more rights being stripped away from the native population. This video is part one in a two-part series examining the history of South Africa and in particular its social structures and how colonialism affected their societies. The Africans would go on to live under a system that deprived them of their rights. This system was one that divided them and caused them to be dominated by the Afrikaners and the British whites. This system would come to be known as apartheid. In my next video, I will explain how these subjugated peoples ended this system. I want to give a shout out to my good friend at the State of the World who um, if he hadn't uh, offered to uh, animate that section, I would have had to draw a lot more slides, and he's totally great, wonderful editing. Go follow his channel, link in the description. What a, what a guy, what a guy.